Hey everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, I see some of you are looking at your watch saying, well, it's, it's, it's after 7. So if you realize if you did get the agenda, I didn't put the time. I mean, that says 7 to 9, but I didn't put the time that we were going to start, and I was going to go. Okay? I did that on purpose. So after 15 minutes of mingling, which I didn't put on the agenda, but you understand, we're going to go ahead and get started. So for those of you who do not know me, my name is Barry Gasselberry. I am proud to be the president of the Roseville team here. And we are very honored this evening to have with us President Pro Tem Tate. And one thing I love when I when he came in, he says, all you have to do is let me know and I'll be there. And that is so true. You call him, he's there. So he's going to talk to us today about the Adult Medical Marijuana Ordinance. So without any further ado, please put your hands together and let's welcome up. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. My apologies for the tiredness here. We're trying to get this PowerPoint together. Uh, also, we brought a few copies just in case it didn't work out. But thank you. It's very important. Thank you. All right. So, today I wanted to brief you on the adult use uh, cannabis ordinance that is now being introduced to City Council. As a matter of fact, just yesterday we had the uh, first public hearing. It will be uh, appearing before the full city council next Tuesday for a potential yeah, vote there. to approve. Uh, there are some amendments that some of my colleagues have that they are looking to uh, make some changes to. Uh, but what you see here before you is what's officially on the council table and uh, being circulated as we speak. And so, uh, if you don't mind, we'll go to the first slide. So what we have here in this first slide, I just want to make sure the first slide matches what I have here. <laughs> so the first slide we have, uh, today we're going to be talking about adult use marijuana licensing. So if you look at the quadrant here, licensing today is not zoning and land use. So when we talk about zoning and land use, that's where these facilities can be, uh, how is that, where they can populate. We're not talking about that today. That's not what this uh, ordinance is about. It's about who is allowed to license and what are the qualifications who are allowed to uh, enter into the process of the awarded licensing, excuse me, and also uh, what are those qualifications that are um, that we're going to require to you, uh, be in the pool to be licensed. It also talks a little bit about the Detroit Equity, excuse me, Detroit Legacy uh, Program. So many of you probably heard about that. That was a major piece of our initial ordinance. And let me go back just a little bit of time. Mark, excuse me, November of 2020, the Detroit City Council on our final day of uh, session in 2020 voted to approve the adult use uh, cannabis or marijuana ordinance for the city of Detroit. Fast forward uh, in April when the licenses, we were opening up for the licenses, the uh, applications to come into the city of Detroit. Uh, day one, we ended up getting a lawsuit. So we accepted it about two or three, not too many. But we got a lawsuit. Uh, from an individual who said that she, for whatever reason, didn't even apply for a legacy trip, but she felt that she would not have an opportunity to receive a license, and she sued the city. Didn't think much of it, because you know, we knew we were going to get sued. We know that we're going to get sued in this ordinance, no matter what ordinance we have, we're going to get sued. It's just a matter of, 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 of the game. Um, but didn't really worry too much about it, because the issues that she raised were the same issues that we had followed and looked at as we developed this work. Unfortunately, we drew a judge that was not favorable towards our ordinance. 
and he raised issues indicating that our ordinance could possibly violate the uh, Constitution. And if you go to the next slide, if you will, if you look at the bottom left hand corner, it says here on May 27th, you see that date there, on May 27, 2001, the court heard oral arguments. Uh, as explained more fully below, the court shall grant plaintiff's motion for a preliminary injunction because the city ordinance governing the process for obtaining a recreational marijuana retail license gives an unfair, irrational, and likely unconstitutional advantage to long-term Detroit residents over all other applicants. Now, who else should get those benefits? Long-term Detroit, right? That would make sense, but the judge indicated here that he felt that it was irrational and um, potentially unconstitutional, which meant that we had to either, one, go to court and say that, okay, if you still want to try this out, we can go to court, and that won't be until September 2022. We got this order from the court all the way back in August of last year. So we knew that waiting until September of 2022 was not really feasible. One, because residents of the city of Detroit voted for uh, cannabis adult use uh, cannabis 68%. Uh, that's how uh, Detroit voted, which was higher than the state, which was 57%. So clearly there was a desire. Uh, there's also individuals who are in the industry who wanted to transfer uh, or convert their license from medical marijuana to adult use, which is essentially recreational licensing. And so we knew that there was a desire there. We know that there are consumers as well in the city of Detroit who want to have cannabis in the city of Detroit as opposed to Ferndale or Rumble and other places where they're going to pick up their, their products. So again, the desire has been clearly made that this is something that the citizens of the city of Detroit want. The question typically lies in the zoning, where, right? Not in my backyard. We hear that a lot, but that's not what we're talking about in this process. <laughs> again. So, we were, we were placed on hold. And again, if for us to further this ordinance that we had last year, we would have to wait until September of this year. Now, what's challenging with that is, there's always folks who want to put together a ballot initiative to get Detroiters to vote the way that they want them to vote on. How many of you were familiar with the issue of magic mushrooms before the ballot? How many of you thought it was coming on our ballot? It was going to be on our ballot. Yeah, not many hands. It passed without any issue whatsoever. So that is, that's always my concern. And whenever there's marijuana on a, on a ballot initiative, it always passes with flying colors. And so that is one consideration that I have to think about. Do we wait and try this out in court in September of 2022 and allow a ballot initiative to take away any protections that we as a city would like to see uh, in this particular industry? Or do we play, quote unquote, hard, go to court, and still potentially may lose as well? So all of these things are being considered as we move forward. What I decided to do is draft additional, a, a different ordinance, taking into account all of these different individuals in the city of Detroit who want to see it, don't want to see it, want to see it in a certain kind of way, but ultimately also taking into account that language that the judge has um, that put the restraining order on the ordinance that we have currently in place. So a lot of factors that are, are moving. Next slide, please. So what you're going to see here, uh, in the ordinance, we have allowed, and let me just say these numbers that you see here are not very different than the numbers that we had in the original ordinance. Retail licenses, and when we say retail, we're talking about dispensaries. 76 licenses. That's one more than was proposed in the current ordinance that the judges put in. He had 75. Uh, for designated consumption lounges, and the designated consumption lounge is a place where you can consume your cannabis. Uh, similar to a bar or somewhere where you would go and consume your cannabis, not necessarily always purchase it there. You purchase it from one location, you can consume it. At this, uh, this, this particular uh, site, uh, we have 30 of those uh, licenses being made available. In the past, in the previous orders, we had 35. I'll tell you, there's only been two of these that have been a license in the entire state. There's some challenges when it comes to designated consumption lounges, when it comes to insurance, from what I'm hearing from a lot of individuals who are seeking this type of license, which 
makes it even more difficult for them to obtain it. Um, but nonetheless, the state allows it. This is a license that we allow in the city of Detroit as well. Micro business. This is like a mom and pop shop. You got to do everything in that business in, in that particular location. You grow it, you process it, you sell it. You can't at this point right now take any product from any outside uh, facility and sell it at your location. This is a micro business. Now, there's a lot of folks who want this micro business. It's very appealing to them. The challenge is, at least currently, is the plant count. Let's say you have a crop that goes bad. You're done for a long time until you get another yield of your, your, your product. And so it's risky, a little bit more risky for the micro business because everything is self-contained here. In the past, ordinance, we had 35 licenses available today. In this ordinance, we're allowing 30. And we're going to potentially tweak these. These are numbers. This is a living, breathing document. This is what I always remind folks. As we mature in this industry, and members of the community have different tastes about how they want to see the industry grow. Um, you'll see, I'm sure, this council, former uh, uh, future councils, make amendments to what is being put uh, before us today. But again, this is our starting point. And when you see these other licenses, these unlimited licenses, Again, not anything different than what we had in the previous ordinance. These licenses were unlimited uh, pre previously. Now, grower, you got to have a certain amount of space that is allowed for growing. So we didn't feel the need to, to, to limit the number of licenses there, a massive amount of space. Same with processor. And again, processor is the one who transforms the cannabis plant into products. Safety compliance facility, those are the locations that make sure that the cannabis that is consumed is safe uh, and for consumption. Temporary marijuana event organizer, essentially someone who's like a broker for marijuana events that you'll see right underneath there. These are sanctioned events that would have to go through a license or go through a certification process um, and would get approval from the city before being allowed to uh, take place. And then secure transport, that is a license for anyone who would be transporting your cannabis from one location to the other. Of course, that would be more than the allowable uh, uh, two ounces that you know, all of us are able to have on our own person. Uh, that you would need a license for as well. And when we go into the rubric, and some of you have this uh, document, you, everyone have this sheet in your hand here? That is seven. Because there were a few changes in it, so we're going to go and look at this document instead of the one we have in power. So it's a little bit different. So the question is, how do you have an opportunity or qualify to apply for a license? And one way you do so, so what we did was we created a, two different pathways. So one, uh, Lane, you have equity app applicants. So these are your social equity applicants, the individuals who have been uh, from disproportionately impacted communities like Detroit. Uh, it also includes your legacy Detroiters that we talked about in the previous ordinance. Uh, on the other side, you have everybody else essential. These are non-social equity applicants. So we wanted to create two different pathways. Understanding that equity applicants, the thing that equity applicants uh, often need more than uh, non-equity, it's your capital, you need re revenue, resources, but then also property and land. And so this ordinance is also trying to address those issues as well. Can't say it's perfect, but we're making our best attempt. So when you look at it, so you look at page one of two, non-equity applicants, social equity applicants, a business plan, site control, due diligence are all the same. This is the basic stuff that the state requires. In order for you to get the full maximum amount of points, you would have to get 127 points. Okay, so business plan, site control, due diligence, that's 75 points right there. And again, that is the same for both sides, equity and non-equity. And these are basic, uh, basic requirements that even the state requires. So then we go to the good neighbor plan, which again applies to both equity and non-equity applicants. And what's different here, um, and I won't say it's different, but what this does is it, it allows the community to actually have more of an influence in this particular case. Now, mind you, that any, any business that's looking to set up adult use is going to have to go through um, a uh, site control um, uh, hearing. So the community will have a say-so in this particular entity moving into their neighborhood. 
not so much the industrial location, so many of the unlimited licenses that you see will be allowable in industrial areas. In most of the industrial areas, you don't have these neighborhoods, so we have not created that component for those licenses, but certainly for the ones that are limited licenses that I gave you the numbers for. Uh, that's where uh, these good neighbor uh, points will apply. And so if you see here, uh, any applicant would have to agree to a commitment to hiring Detroiters, uh, also your commitment to purchasing goods from Detroit businesses, a pricing commitment, as well as a commitment to invest in surrounding neighborhoods. Now when I say pricing commitment, uh, what we found is in the industry, uh, many of those who currently have facilities are not providing, um, they're not being fair and equitable, equitable to our Detroit uh, entrepreneurs who are in the cannabis industry. So I'll give you just a little bit. Right now we have about 68 licenses that have been uh, issued for retail. Of those 68 licenses, about seven of them, seven, eight, you know, who's open, who's closed, are Detroiters. And if we didn't do anything drastic, and this is the medical industry I'm talking about, if we didn't do anything drastic like what we're talking about here, there's no doubt that the recreational market or adult use would look exactly like that. My goal has always been 50% of these limited licenses should go to Detroiters and equity applicants. Folks say that couldn't happen. Uh, we're well within our, uh, well on our way to making that happen based on the rubric that we have in place here today. When you look at also your commitment to leadership and your commitment to the city of Detroit, your non-equity applicants uh, and your equity applicants will have to do the same thing. You have to show that you've had uh, some leadership role in a duly established and licensed, if applicable, uh, Detroit-based business, nonprofit, religious organization, uh, educational institution, or block club and neighborhood association for uh, the previous five years. Very important. Again, that is a way for you to get your points, but it's also a way to show that you had some um, uh, engagement and some influence and also some participation within the city of Detroit. And when you flip the page, that's when it gets a little bit more controversial for a lot of folks. And that's where we seem to lose some of the folks um, in the industry, for sure. Uh, again, what we did was we're, we're trying to address this issue of resources as well as um, space and land. And so if you are a non-equity applicant, you know, on your left-hand side, if you sell a property at uh, within two years prior to applying for your license for less than 50% of the market value, you would get the maximum amount of 25 points. That's a big deal because we have a feeling that everybody on this side is going to try to max out that 127 points. And so getting the non-equity applicant to partner or provide space with an equity applicant is a win-win for, for all of us. If, in fact, you don't have uh, space to, to, to provide, you can also do a joint venture with an equity applicant. And you'll see here, 41% to 50% equity uh, will provide you those 25 points. Uh, when you go down, uh, now we're talking leasing. Uh, that's where you get a few more points, but certainly not more than what you would get for selling your property. 15 points allowable uh, will be provided if you provide a leasing of a space for 50%. Uh, below the market value, or 31 to 40 percent of equity. Drop down below that, and it's if you provide a lease to an equity applicant, 60 percent uh, below the market value uh, rate, and then, or excuse me, 20 to 30 percent equity. Uh, joint venture with the equity applicant will provide you five points. Most of them, is again, are going to seek to get the maximum amount, amount of points. And so that will provide the opportunity for an equity applicant to partner with or at least be provided um, space in the city of Detroit that has been completely consumed by those who have resources on the front end and made it extremely difficult for Detroiters to find space that they can utilize for their own businesses. Now on the other side of things, the equity applicants, we're not putting those same types of burdens on equity applicants. Because again, these are the folks that we're trying to help uh, get into the industry because they were frozen out in so many different ways based on barriers uh, of entry in the city of Detroit as well as other places as well. Um, if you come from a city that is, has 33, excuse me, 35 percent of the population that is below the federal poverty rate, you get 
of 25 points. And that's got to be your primary resident. Now, where do you think the city of Detroit falls? Within that percentile. And so if you're Detroit, you will end up getting the highest amount of points in this category as a social equity applicant. When you drop down, if you're from a municipality, if you live or your primary residence is in a municipality, 30% uh, below the poverty rate is 15 uh, points, and then 20% below the poverty rate is five points. We also want folks to join the joint venture program with the state. Uh, if your social equity program is so good, we want it published. We want others to replicate what you have. So that gives you another point. Remember, every point counts because it's going to be a very competitive process. And then also uh, committing to, um, so one is joining the joint venture program and the other is publishing your social equity uh, program. So those are two different points that are very, very key and vital to individuals who want to max out their amount of points. Now the question is what happens when everybody's equal in points? What if everybody gets 127 points? Then we go to a lottery. And the lottery will be published. Uh, it will be pub uh, publicized and televised publicly so that everything that we do is transparent. You'll see the lottery balls or the work. We try to go with the Michigan State Lottery and say, no, we're not doing that. So we're going to be partnering with somebody else, some other entity. Uh, have not been identified at this point, but the commitment again is to make sure that this is done publicly and transparent so everyone can see the work that is done. So this is the scoring rubric that has been put together. Again, caused a bit of controversy for those who are in the industry. Um, but I think it's necessary because we have to you know, address as many of the concerns that we can. Let's go to the next slide. So applications will be provided in actually three phases. We have four on there, but I'll talk about that fourth phase. So the licensing will take place three phases. The first phase, once we, as council, approve the ordinance. Uh, the second, and there will be a 30-day uh, application period. So you have 30 days to put your application in. The city of Detroit will receive it, and then we cut it off after those 30 days. After those 30 days, we have 120 days at least before another period of licensing begins. Because we want, again, this is a marathon, not a sprint. It's not about making sure we get every license out there right now. We want to tweak it. There's some issues that we need to tweak. We want to tweak them in real time because once you mess up in this industry, it's all over. You take the court. Uh, you miss out on opportunities for those that are trying to get into this industry as well. So we want to make sure we're steady when we uh, approach this industry. Uh, the second 30-day uh, period, and then you also have a third 30-day period. Now here's again what's different in this ordinance than the previous. Uh, we recognize that there are some businesses that are currently open right now, medical marijuana facilities, um, and we did not allow licenses up to that, that number. Uh, part of the reason for me is because, again, Allowing equity applicants in Detroit, Alexa Detroiters, to get into this industry and have an opportunity to have success before you have this onslaught of everybody else coming in, I think it's extremely important. Again, providing the best opportunity to succeed. Uh, but what we did, again, recognizing that many of these businesses have put in a lot of work and time and effort uh, and revenue, money, into their businesses. So we're going to allow them, after five years, those who were not, who were, if you're currently licensed, if you were not uh, awarded the license in the first, second, or third phase, the city of Detroit will allow you to convert your medical marijuana license to a adult use recreational marijuana license. But you'll still have to go through all of the regulations and requirements that we require any of the businesses to go through. You just won't end up in a lot. You're almost guaranteed at that point. But you got to wait five years. Again, people are not necessarily ex excited about that, but I think that's as fair as we can get, understanding the challenges that we have in front of us. Uh, when will licensing begin? Licensing can begin for those unlimited licenses that I mentioned, literally a week after we vote on this. Because we already have the infrastructure that's ready. It's unlimited. If there's any challenges that we have, we can always go back and you know, uh, correct any of those issues. It's the limited licenses where we end up getting in trouble, um, potentially. And so we're going to hold off maybe about a month or so to make sure that every process that we have that's going to touch these limited licenses are doing exactly what we needed to do before we go live. But uh, about a month after we approved this ordinance, we really could start up uh, accepting license applications for these limited licenses that we have 
on the time you put in the show you did. And that's, yeah, that's what we'll stop it right there. Um, the rest of this if you're looking for us on the very last So if you're looking for this information, if you want to get a copy of the ordinance itself, also this slide deck so you can take it uh, to your various communities and, and neighborhoods, that's where you will find information. Try to make it real easy by putting a bitly up there and actual words and not just little letters. So take a look at that and we'll keep it up as long as uh, allowed to do so during this uh, Q&A time. And that's what I would like to do now. If there's any questions, uh, concerns, or any suggestions, now's the time. We have the uh, full body again. It's going to be before the full body next Tuesday. Uh, the council and here will go into effect uh, on that day. Yes, sir. Two questions. Yes. So I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, this is what happens in the q and I forget things, <laughs> and you remind me. So what we did was we indicated that whatever you agreed to um, to obtain your license, if you're looking to get it renewed, you have to uh, sustain it. And we have the Department of CREO, Civil Rights and uh, Civil Rights and Inclusion. Uh, that's the department that monitors not just this ordinance, but they monitor all of the ordinance. So when we talk about the 50%, Make, ensuring that we have 50% Detroiters uh, uh, working at uh, work sites. And if they don't hit 50% of the developer, then uh, the developer then has it is fine. That's what CREO does. When it comes to identifying and ensuring that when these developers create these developments, that we have uh, Detroiters, 20% uh, of them, uh, of, of locations, of apartments, excuse me, are uh, affordable housing. That's what CREO does as well. So this is the department that does this overall, and they'll be the ones that are in charge to ensure that the good neighbor plans. Second question. I have two. Uh, same question. Detroit has a large city of Michigan, mm -hmm. like five times bigger than the next size, which is Grand Rapids. What are the other, other large cities in the state of Michigan to address this issue? How does Detroit compare? to the other city councils and the same problem. Yeah, many of the cities uh, really have not placed that much attention on social media. Uh, this is much more of a heavy lift on our end because of the demographic of the city of Detroit. Uh, when we look at the fact that we have such a high poverty, again, 33% of our uh, population is below the federal poverty rate. And when we look at the fact that the war on drugs ravaged our community, uh, black and brown folks went to jail other folks are making money off the same plan yeah. that they went to jail for. That makes our city just a little bit different than some of those other, and the massive um, uh, scale upon which the negative uh, disproportionate uh, arrest and, and impact of cannabis uh, convictions took place in the city of Detroit means that we have to do a heavier lift. So you won't find a lift that's heavy this out uh, in many of these municipalities. Many of them will uh, place a social equity component in a particular neighborhood or a census tract. Uh, unfortunately for the city of Detroit, it wasn't just one part of our city that was affected negatively by and disproportionately by cannabis arrest. It was the entire city. And so now we've got to be a little bit more aggressive than other places. We were very much more aggressive in the last ordinance. Just said we can't do that. Um, could have taken it you know, all the way. I would have loved to, but it's just a lot more riding, a lot more at stake that I'm just not willing to risk. Again, the ballot initiative will wipe out any of this stuff that we're trying to do in terms of protections for our uh, choice. Good neighbor plan, gone. Doesn't have to do with the ballot initiative. So uh, it's a balance. It's a balance. Yes, sir. Good morning. Yes, sir. Um, I'm a resident of Detroit.
And there's no license that we have for it here because it's a private social club. So as long as there is a membership that is um, attached to it, we as a city should do what we can. We, we, we've knocked on the door a couple of times there. You know what I'm saying? Um, as long as it's determined that there is a, a membership fee to enter the facility and to be a part of it, uh, it kind of pulls us out. What if it's $5? I don't think the amount is, 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 is really good. Yeah. I mean, again, we're talking state law, not city. Sure. city mm -hmm. And let me just say this too. The other thing is, these three phases that I told you about, in terms of licensing, city council will approve those phases. They don't just automatically happen. So what we are doing is, again, CREAR also, is also a department that is preparing and working with our equity applicants in Legacy Detroit. So right now we have uh, currently, I uh, believe the number as of late, 500, about 500 Detroiters have been certified as Legacy Detroiters. And they're giving them the tutelage, the mentoring, the connectivity, the networking, uh, to try to identify uh, ways to address the deficits that they have. If it's land, if it's you know, financial resources, maybe it's just overall knowledge of the industry. Maybe it's just understanding the laws themselves. That's what CREO does. And so before city council uh, moves forward with a, another uh, phase of licensing, we need, to, we need CREO to show its work. Let us show us that we have Detroiters that are able to compete for these licenses. We can never guarantee anybody's going to get a license. That's when you get in trouble. But what we can guarantee is that we're going to do our best to ensure that Detroiters are able to compete for these licenses. If, if, if Creo cannot show us that they've helped uh, create a situation where Detroiters are able to compete for these licenses, that 120 day span that we have between licensing phases will expand to whatever that number is going to be. So that's another uh, safeguard that we have to ensure that this doesn't just go off the rails. You will have an opportunity to, to, to speak with me. We'll have a chance to talk, and other council districts will also have an opportunity to uh, communicate with their uh, council member to ensure that they're doing the same thing, making sure that they uh, see uh, that social equity applicants and Detroiters have the best chance at succeeding in this industry. I will tell you that there are some amendments that are being put forward by some of my colleagues. So you see the number here, I have 76 of retail. Some people say that number's too low for a city like ours. I mean, people say that Detroit is five times larger Six. You hear that. And you'll have others who say, well, no, I, I still don't like cameras. So I've got one of my colleagues who is uh, looking to propose an amendment for 240 uh, retail establishments in the city of Detroit. Um, just to let you know what the lay of the land looks like. And I know uh, there's a number of individuals within the industry that would like to see a number that large as well. If I can ask just in the room here tonight, what's a good number that sounds good to you? Zero. Zero. <laughs> well, I can't do zero. I'm gonna let you know that now. I'm always honest with you. Can't do zero. But let's let's hear some help if you don't mind. Okay. Two questions. City wide. Instead of a thousand feet, uh, 
um, between control uses. I'm proposing 750 feet only for that uh, uh, restriction for control uses. Now, again, uh, some people may go, no, that's horrible. If you hear some of the things that I've heard from my colleagues, you probably welcome that. Uh, so there's some uh, potential amendments where they're saying that they want to move all of at least all of the licensing from the neighborhoods and put them all in downtown. And you can't take any licenses away from the businesses that are currently established. They're just saying moving forward, no more in the community, but all of them downtown. You have some that say that they want to create a, a green zone, so to speak, a certain area in the, in, in the city that is only for cannabis. Well, which district? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that's part of the question as well for many people in the community. Um, so a lot of that is, is, is where we are today. What you see, what I presented is the, 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 the foundation of where we stand. Uh, there's a lot of other comments and potential amendments that are being uh, put forward. So I just want to make sure you know that what you see today may not be the final final I'm pushing for, because I think this is a good solid ordinance. It gives us an opportunity to open up in a way that, in my opinion, makes sense. It's gradual, not a complete shock to the system. It also provides equity applicants and Detroiters a chance to enter into the industry. It also respects the fact that we have those who have provided, uh, who have businesses currently operating, uh, and they may not have a chance in the first, second, or third round, still giving them an opportunity after five years to uh, establish and convert their license. So I believe, again, it's, it, 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 it works on a, a, a number of different levels. But I'll tell you that there's not everybody satisfied about what we have in front of us today. Uh, I was just telling uh, Kim over there that, that there are some folks who uh, were supportive of the last ordinance, but they hate this one because it's not Detroit, Detroit. It doesn't have a direct line that says Detroit. But we worked as best as we could to provide as much of the best opportunity for Detroiters to uh, uh, be awarded these licenses. But we can't based upon what we got in the court, said it can only be in Detroit. So that's painful, but it's part of the legislation. Yes, sir. I'm glad to hear that because I had a conversation with some individual last week, and they were saying that Detroiters were being pushed aside, that the licensing was too hard for Detroiters to get. But looking at this, I'm feeling a little bit better because I was thinking, why, why, why? Now I understand there's a lot more to the licensing than we think. And if they don't know all the, the, the processes to go through, they're just talking. And they're just saying that Detroiters would be left out. You just said we can't guarantee a license. You can't force the court to allow what we need if that's what we want to do. Those people are going to do it. So I'm glad that, and this needs to be put somewhere, out somewhere where other people can see it, because these folks have gone to a meeting and they came back and told me that Detroiters can't get licensed in Detroit because of a lot of different racial problems. And I said, well, then we need to find out what those are. Because now I see what you're saying, well, it's, it's more to it than that. And I'm glad to hear you be transparent, and then the equity will come through somehow through the court. At least Detroiters will have a chance. We're doing our best to bypass the court at this point because the court is, you know, it's a, it's a toss up. You may win, you may lose, and while you're going through this trial, that ballot initiative drops and people sign off on a ballot initiative like magic mushrooms that most of us didn't even know uh, what the language meant when we read it. And that's again a big fear of mine. That's the thoughts on that. Yes, sir. Maybe a dumb question, but is that trick or rubric being applied to other regulated industries within the city? So even if there's not a demand for liquor store licenses or bars or car dealerships, do you expect to expand this methodology into other occupations and licenses in the future? As of now, I can't say that's the case because you know, this is one that's highly regulated. It was one that was created because of the competitive nature. Most licenses aren't this competitive that we have in the city. So, um, but we are looking to, to replicate what we have for the legacy Detroit uh, aspect of the ordinance. We just haven't yet sat down and figured out from a city standpoint how that will work out. So if you are a Detroiter that lives in the city of Detroit, you know, 15 of the last 30 years, can we give you a discount or something?
some other type of incentive with this either product, taxes. I don't know if you Dutch taxes. That's enough for me to take, take, draw that one back. But some other type of incentive would benefit. Let me just say that. Uh, we have not come up with that yet, but that has been um, a discussion that we've had. We have. We continue to have. Any additional questions? Yes, sir. When you're uh, referring to the social energy applicants in the new ordinance, is that, in my understanding, that's the Detroit legacy criteria from the old ordinance? And or the state social equity criteria? It's, it's both. But I will say um, it does not include the one element. Because to be a social equity applicant for the state, you can it can be something as simple as you being a, a, care, a care, caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, that to me is not a, a, a strong enough qualifier to be on the social equity category for the city of Detroit license. So we did not put that as a, a qualifier, but everything else uh, within that definition. In addition to legacy of Detroit, to answer your question. And then the second question on the, uh, the rubric, scoring rubric, and the, the places where it's bifurcated between the non equity and equity. Um, have, have you already started like putting together your arguments for when that gets challenged, similar to Travis City, that it doesn't, it doesn't get too best suited to comply with the law? So I, I can't say we're, we're putting the arguments together yet for the law, so we're putting the argument, arguments together to get the ordinance passed. <laughs> first, and then I mean, we certainly have you know we, we're, we're crossing our T's and you know we're dotting our eyes, but at the end of the day, somebody's going to see. You know, uh, we've already been threatened, you know, by a number of folks before we even the uh, the ink is dry on this document. So we're prepared for it. Um, you know, hopefully, if, if it does go end up going to court, we don't get a bad draw like we did before. So, Judge Fritton, the, the judge who is the one that enjoined the to put the restraining order on this uh, ordinance here. When he was an attorney, he was the attorney who fought against affirmative action at U of M. So we talk about a bad draw. It was a bad draw for us. Bad, bad draw for us. So we could have got another judge and it wouldn't have been this. We wouldn't even have this conversation regarding the moving forward of, of the previous ordinance. Um, but here we are. We're going to do our best to make it. Thank you all, and if you have any additional questions, that's our information there. Please give us a call, email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I know some people are saying, who's next? And so, one of the things I know someone brought up, I hope everybody can hear me, is a couple of years ago, we had one of the utilities come in in the neighborhood. Things happened, and not everybody was happy. So, happy. So, we said, well, we know the water department has something coming up. You think you can get them to come in and talk? And just out of the blue, I got an email from Terrence Hicks, and the water department is here. They're going to let us know about some things they're going to be doing in our community. So, without any further ado, I'd like to all of you please to come up. We can clap that
the condition of the hydrants, uh, and knowing too that eventually we have to replace lead service lines across the city of Detroit. So when we do water main replacement projects, we're also replacing lead service lines. So we, uh, because we're Detroit Water and Sewage Department, we operate the two systems. So the two systems are the water that gets delivered to your house, and the sewage and storm water that the sewage gets, gets taken away from your house, um, out through the back, and then uh, the storm water that comes off your street. So uh, your sewer and storm water systems were assessed, and these are the local systems uh, that carry uh, distribute water and um, collect sewage. Uh, this is separate from the original system that connects to the treatment plants. It's operated by the Great Lakes Water Authority. Um, we have a five-year capital improvement program that started to address aging infrastructure. It's a $500 million commitment. We're going to accelerate that program, thankfully, with uh, President Biden's commitment and U.S. Congress with the federal infrastructure dollars that are coming our way. Uh, but so far, we have spent $200 million across the city of Detroit, including here in uh, North Rosedale Park. As you've probably seen, uh, we've been here for a couple of years doing water and sewer upgrades, and we're finishing that project this spring. Now, in Rosedale Park, um, we are embarking on both water system upgrades. Um, about four or five streets need the water main to be replaced. Um, on those streets where we're replacing the water main, we're also going to replace lead service lines. It's the most efficient way for us to replace the lead line that's going into your house, if you have a lead line. And on those streets, we have to, um, when we're replacing the water main, we also have to expose every stop box. So every box that's in front of your house, that's sometimes blue, uh, it's your turn on, turn off valve for your water service that goes into your house we have to ver visually verify whether that's lead, copper, or galvanized, and that's this lead or galvanized, we'll replace it at our cost, as long as we're replacing the water main on your street. Uh, you are formed in advance of that project. Uh, within one week of construction starting on that street, you will receive a door hanger, and then if they find a lead service line, you will get contacted by the contractor and they will schedule an appointment for replacement. And your water will be out approximately about four hours for the lead service line replacement. And the sewer um, on the other side is a little less. Uh, when we replace water mains, we do cut the street, we replace the pipe, and then also replace the service lines that go in. And that's less obstructive because now we're doing um, hydro excavating, so we only dig the area around the stop box and we pull the copper pipe through the basement uh, from the sap box. Now, sewer repair is a little different. Uh, they're much larger pipes on the west side of the city. The sewer system uses mostly gravity, so uh, sometimes the pipes can be very uh, deep underground uh, because they're using gravity. It could come from the north end of the city and then go down to the treatment plant. Um, so they could be deep underground when we have to uh, replace a section of sewer pipe, um, we have to excavate. Where we do try to um, rehabilitate the pipe, where the pipe's still in good condition but we can align it, uh, we try to do that as much as possible. That's less ob uh, obstructive um, and less dirt and debris in your area. Um, we can do that through a manhole. Uh, they put a lining material into the pipe and during that time, the residents are told on that block not to use your, your drains, your washer, your dishwasher, um, and flush the toilet during that time. You'll get a door in there uh, that informs you in advance of that project on the street for the sewer side. Um, because if you do use flush your toilet or if you use your drains while they're doing sewer work, they'll back up into your house. So you don't want that to happen. So you do get advance notice. Uh, with a yellow door hanger, uh, and just so you know, the water system we use blue door hangers, the sewer system we use yellow door hangers, just so uh, you can differentiate the type of work. Um, and if we do need to get in the easement, we know most of
mostly in Brookdale Park. A lot of the fences over the years have been moved back because the city vacated the alleys, and so there, the sewer is still under the, the utilities are still under there. So if we have to remove a fence, we'll recreate, replace it with light fence. So if it's chain link, we'll replace chain link. If it's wood, we'll replace it with wood. Uh, if there's a garage, hopefully no garages are encroaching on the easement. There are, were some garages in North Roosevelt Park and here, here in this neighborhood um, that were actually on the easement that we had to uh, tear down. So, um, and those residents actually uh, just wanted the financial reimbursement. They didn't want to rebuild their garages. So we do give the option to the residents. Uh, because if we do rebuild the garage, you're giving a cost replacement for the garage if it's over the easement. They have to rebuild it out of the easement because um, we still have to have access to the utility um, easement. So that's in very rare cases, um, but you'll be contacted in advance. We do a lot of pre-notification, such as uh, for the water, water upgrades. We did a virtual meeting back in April. Um, most of the residents in the Roosevelt Park should have received a notice on those streets for the sewer project, which will happen in sometime in the spring. We'll do another uh, community meeting. We'll notice those houses on those streets that will have sewer work, that there'll be a community meeting. So we'll have a contractor and an engineer representative at that meeting to answer specific questions about the sewer project. Um, and then we provide updates uh, throughout the project and the no door notifications as well as uh, inspectors, UWSD inspectors are on site to answer any questions or concerns that folks may have. The last thing with the water project, just as a precautionary measure, if you are on the street of a water main replacement project, we give a pitcher filter and a cartridge um, in advance of construction, just as a precautionary measure, not that um, the water is safe, it is safe, but there may be debris that's constructed in the pipe while we're doing construction. So that's given a, a cautionary measure. Uh, and those are also property restoration. Please take a photo. If you're having work done, um, if you are any on any of the streets, and um, we can get you that information. Um, if you're having work done and you get one of these door hangers, Please take pictures in advance, take pictures of your sidewalk, take pictures of your easement, if it's a sewer system door hanger repair. Um, in advance, just so you have those on file, because that not only um, just for your protection, but we also, our contractor takes pictures in advance, just so that they know the current conditions of the sidewalk, current conditions of the driveway, if they disrupt it, that they restore it to like condition previous to uh, construction. When we do disrupt the street, we'll resurface the half that we've disrupted. We won't be able to resurface um, the full uh, street because uh, we are using water rate dollars for this project. There's no um, DPW or transportation dollars tied to this water and sewer project. Um, and we're available if you have any questions uh, about these sewer and water projects. <laughs> so many questions. Um, you frequently refer to several streets that are going to have water work. Can you tell us what those streets are and the network schedules we have? Sonali has a list that we uh, can share with you okay. of those streets. Uh, there's about four or five streets in the Rosedale Park. I know you did one street back. 
clear that the storm drains are blocked, and then, oh, I know, Auburn, right by uh, Circle Park. Mm. That little short block of Auburn floods, like Lake Michigan. Uh, there's a stretch of evergreen between our drive and Finkel on the east side of the street. Okay. And Ashton between Grand River and Finkel last year.
realize that's an ongoing issue. Um, so Director Brown wanted to do something to uh, help alleviate that issue. So because we can't use public rate dollars, sewer rate dollars on private property to make private repairs, um, we were able to get the Board of Water Commissioners to approve a sewer line warranty provider. They will start mailing you information at the end of April. Um, they will ensure, uh, sure, they will warranty your water service line coming in the front of the house and your sewer line going out the back for $7.98 per month. Um, it's voluntary, but as soon as, um, if you're enrolled in that program with AMWATER, um, after 30 days, you'll be able to file a claim. If you have a clog in your sewer, if your water line busted because it froze, or if the sewer line collapsed, you'll be able to file a claim at that publication. So they're going to mail enrollment, they'll mail a postcard in April, they'll mail a rolling packet in, uh, sometime in May with the information on that program, and you pay them directly, and in return, they're going to put, uh, you know, SD doesn't get any money for it, but they're going to, um, in order for us to share a list, we made an agreement with them that they would put money into the Water Residential Assistance Program for low-income customers. So they're putting about a dollar per household enrolled into the RAP program. Uh, and then they'll, they're going to use License Detroit. That's part of the agreement, too. They have to use licensed Detroit plumbers to do the work. Uh, for the warranty program. So that's something that will be offered because we realize there's a lot of situations in the sewer line can cost ten to twenty thousand dollars to uh, repair. So for eight dollars a month? Eight dollars a month. Mm -hmm. They'll they'll warranty it and do repairs and they'll cover uh, they're not an insurance company, they're a warranty company, they'll cover um, if your water line uh, cracks, oh, the water service line, if it cracks, if it freezes, the sewer line, if it gets a clog, they'll cover the plumber cleaning it out. They'll cover if there's a crack in the sewer line and a portion needs to be replaced, they'll cover if the sewer line collapsed and it needs to be replaced and repaired. What's that? Website, so they'll be rolling that out at the end of April. Um, and because they can do it for $7.98 $7 a month, because of the volume of uh, folks in Detroit that need the program, plus they do this all over the country, Philadelphia, DC, they're a company that does warranty for like how high it is. So they have the ability to have the money to make replacements for those that need it. This is not a scan. No, there's no deductible. There's no as long as you're enrolled in the program. For how long? How long do you have to pay? You continue to pay every month. Then it auto re enrolls you for the next year. Or you can pay at a lower rate for a whole year. And there's no deductible. Um, they will send out enrollment packet information. Uh, this is something Director Brown really pushed because of the cost of repairing sewer lines. Um, so. Yeah, we know that neighborhoods are very eager to hear about this, so we'll, we'll be rolling it out in, in April, and they'll send out families to all the uh, residents. And this is only for residential, the warranty program. For sure. Yes, how do you get that camera uh, footage? How do you get um, that sent to your house? That sent to your house? Yes, you say um, the water board will take a camera you and send it to your food. So um, we can get your address and see if we, when we did the assessments for the sewer system, if we assess the sewer that's behind your house. Um, we put a camera in the city sewer, but we don't go into the, in the individual pipes that go to the houses. But we can see if there's an issue with it at the city connection, if it's collapsing. Um, if roots are coming out of the 
sewer from the house. We can see those issues, but we can't see the full line because we don't put the camera in. Our camera's too big to go into the smaller uh, sewer pipes. Well, I have a line and then we put a sewer in my backyard. So, and that crossing, it's not crossing or uh, anything. We have a crossing? They put a new sewer line. That's good. The water line. Then they, they, they put a new line, then they came back and put a sewer in my line. And I've been having problems ever since. I, they won't, they're not communicating with my insurance company. So I can't get it straightened out if I need to. Well, so, we'll get your information so we can figure out what what's going on with that issue. We'll get it squared away. six to eight weeks to do each street. Um, and they do several blocks at a time. Six to eight weeks and then if it's near the end of the season, they'll have to come back and do the cement um, restoration and the grass. And the grass are planting. The sewer project is going to start uh, later this spring. And that will take a couple years as well. And work already started in the park? Only on the water main, but not the sewer. Not Actually, neither projects, yeah, but we're in the north of the park right now. Did you ever find out the street is Yes, so what's the streets? Um, so, Shelfont, Artesian to Stahelin, Penrod. Wait, 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 Shelfont, Artesian to Stahelin. Penrod. Linden to Eaton, and I apologize, it's only three streets that we were on, and we've already done Southfield service drive, Eaton to Shelfon. You're, you're working right now at the Shelfon, Oh, we are. That's the water main? This water main. The sewer work will begin in the spring. So, is there any other water main work in our neighborhood? Just those three streets, right? This and the reason that it's just a three street is because this project is in six different neighborhoods Newark Park, Miller Grove, Riverdale, Rosedale. So, there's a little bit of work to do. So when they did the condition assessments, they determined what water mains were still alive or what ones needed replacement, and those are the three areas. Now, that service line replacement, we are doing it with water main replacement, but we're also working on some federal and state grants to do individual flood service line replacement where we go uh, in neighborhoods and house by house, whether we're doing the water main or not. We're, um, working on a project to get to a 5,000 control to replace 5,000 lead lines per year. There's about 80,000 in Detroit. And fortunately, there's federal funds to do it now, so um, we'll be rolling that out sometime this year. So we can hear more about that project as well and how to apply. Okay, one more question, and then I'll ask us to move on with the agenda. So can you have your hand up?
at DetroitMI.com.
working. Foreclosures, and now we're into tenant work. 
Um, as you know, there are uh, you're trying to about 55% uh, rental units right now. And <clears throat> so the ordinance, by the way, will be, it's right now in the law department. In about a week and a half to two weeks, it will be uh, submitted to the council by the council president, Mary Sheffield. And our, uh, our district, uh, Pro Tem Tate, is a supporter of the right to council. And uh, so in, in, to, to understand what, what goes on in the housing courts in Detroit, there are four judges. And in, in 2019, before the pandemic, <clears throat> there were 30,600 cases filed in 36 district court. Four judges adjudicated those cases. Um, who is there? I've been in the 36th District Court 28 times with, with someone that Detroit Vision Defense is trying to help keep stay in their home. Who comes in front of the judges? Now, each judge sees approximately 40 people a day in the, in the housing courts. Not all show up, but they don't have time to talk to the to the tenant who's there. They just don't have time. And it's a, they, so a tenant can come up and say, I didn't pay my rent because there's no furnace, or there's water leaking, or roof leaking, excuse me, ma'am, because I saw about 90% of the people who stand in front of the, the judge are black women. So, I'm sorry, ma'am, we can't talk, you need an attorney. Well, you, they're already poor, they, they're, they're behind in their rent and money, they're not gonna be able to hire an attorney, and it has to be a specific attorney. It can't be just anybody, somebody that knows the housing laws. So what, um, what the right to counsel does is that it, the city pays uh, um, um, from the general fund or whomever, um, we're, we're asking right now for about $17 million a year to do this. So it, it's gonna affect about um, 30,000 uh, people a year, which includes children. And so if you're, if you're evicted from your house, it, it causes all kinds of problems and it costs money for the city. Uh, children now have to move to a different school. And, we're, and as we all know right now, the housing uh, stock in Detroit for rentals is really, really competitive. The, the housing uh, costs are going up and it's really difficult. So what, what Right the Council does is that it provides an attorney throughout the person's, uh, 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 as, long, as long as they're in court, they have an attorney representing them. So take the person who stood in front of the judge and said, my, when my furnace is out, uh, what's going to happen? That person will now have an attorney who can make a, 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 a sort of a mediation with the landlord's attorney. Because as it stands right now, 8% of people I'm standing in front of the judge of 36 District Court, have an attorney, eight. If you're a landlord, 93% have, have an attorney. So the landlord always has an attorney, and they always win, they always win. So now it's gonna give a chance for poor Detroiters to have a, a voice. And so the, the attorney for the, the tenant will be able to negotiate with the attorney for the, the uh, the landlord. So there, that, that we have found in uh, New York, Baltimore, Kansas City, um, some of the early uh, New York, San Francisco, and Baltimore, uh, they've been they've had a right to uh, counsel for three years. So at this point, the statistics are overwhelming. If you spend ten million dollars a year, then you're going to get thirty. You're going to save thirty million dollars by keeping people in their homes. And another thing about what we know in Detroit. An empty home, potentially, is going to be a home that's going to be stripped. So if you start moving people out of homes, chances are really good that that home could be stripped. Another situation uh, that, I, that I, I'm, I'm familiar with right now, during COVID, there are that you can't meet in person. You have to meet in Zoom. So um, this is an actual person, got a hold of the Detroit Fiction Defense, got a hold of me. Her name is Ms. Brown. Um, you don't know her. There's lots of Ms. Browns in Detroit. She's 75 years old. She has a cell phone. That cell phone is a phone. It's not text. 
I told her she doesn't have any mail, so she gets a letter in the mail that says you have to appear in court. The reason that she's there had to do with a flooding issue. She's always paying her rent. She's been there five years, never missed a day. So she gets this, it's all confusing. There's numbers, and I gotta get on my phone and do a Zoom. She doesn't do texts or anything. So luckily, she found somebody told her to call us. I went to her house. I sat there and on my phone and we had a Zoom call with the judge at 36 District Court. So today what happens, because of the some of the CARES Act and the SARA funds, there are attorneys available. They're only that available for, to, to just get her through the process, but they're, they're, they do not represent her. Because you're gonna see that at one point, there'll be some, um, there'll, there'll be some debates on right to counsel. Uh, the mayor is saying there already is a right to counsel. There is not. There is not. And as soon as the funds run down, there won't be any. So this person was able to get in touch with an attorney, and what she did was she negotiated with the, uh, the attorney for the landlords, and she got, she, she, you know, it's a long story, but it, she's good to go at this point. So another case, there's another woman, 72 years old, who was evicted, and so it's too late, she didn't have an attorney, she didn't have a mailbox. Her landlord tore the mailbox out of her house. I went there, I got pictures on my phone right now. This, 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 this person who, um, if it weren't for Detroit Eviction Defense, and this is going on all over the city right now, she was evicted by a woman who owned the house who, it's, who will not take SARA funds to, for her back rent. The reason is, is because it's not registered and it's not in compliance. So in order for, and she could have gotten thousands of dollars but the reason she, she turned it down and evicted this woman is because the, the, she doesn't want an inspector to come and inspect the house. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but there, there are four windows, four windows in the house that, don't, that aren't broken. Every other window in the house is broken. Every single basement window. There's water right now in the basement. She doesn't live there anymore. But the, 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 there's only, she can, she can use the bathtub to wash her clothes and herself and her kitchen sink, those are the only sinks that work. So, I mean, it's, it's really awful in there. And if it weren't for, if, it, if, if she had an opportunity to go to court and have an attorney, this all would have made a difference in her life. She's living in a motel right now, which is being paid for by Sarah funds. But I'm just saying that this is gonna come up, I think, maybe in the newspaper, there may be some uh, public, uh, uh, you know, there, there may be, uh, some press conferences and so on. So at least you have a background of uh, what's going on with, you know, with the housing situation in Detroit. So I'll just end it there because I know we're getting late. So any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, it's needed. If the tenant does not pay rent and they don't put it in escrow, when they get the lawyer and they, you know, they go to court, what is the uh, judge usually going to do? If there's an attorney that's representing represent them, for example, if somebody lost their job because of COVID or whatever, and, but now they have a job, so they're, they owe maybe a thousand bucks that rent. Um, there can be negotiations. Most landlords would like to have the person stay there. So, okay, I'm now making money, and I'll pay an extra 50 bucks a month, or whatever, whatever would be, and, and that's until it's paid off. Whereas if they didn't have an attorney, that, that they're just going to be evicted because they cannot negotiate by themselves. That's good. Uh, second question: If um, this, this Sarah fund is paying the, the landlord, yes. So many of the landlords now, I, this is what I'm hearing, they're not trying to evict them because they're going to get that money anyway. Yes. So they're letting them stay there, not pay yes. the rent. Yes. They're not putting the money in escrow, right. but then when this tariff fund money stops, will they cause them to pay all of that back that they didn't pay? Well, if you, they've applied, and see, part of the application is, is that the landlord has to fill out an application. Okay. It's not just the tenant. So that's why the landlords often don't want to get the tariff ceremony because they don't want to get their house certified. They don't want to see the inspector and look at it. 
nor do they want to have it registered. I think it's only 12% of the houses in Detroit right now are registered and certified. And I'm really talking about people like us, Stephen Hagerman and Michael Kelly. They own hundreds and hundreds of homes, and they are slum ones, period. So, thank you, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else? to the end, so I would do the President's report, it would be brief. Uh, we, neighborhood Cleanup is going to be this Saturday, hopefully everybody saw it on the e-blast, we're going to meet outside of Chase Bank, uh, I think Melody Bunkley is leading this, it's going to be from 9 to 11, hopefully everybody can still hear me, I, hopefully I have enough voice left so I can protect, but uh, as she says, bring your gloves, bring your brooms and things to pick up, but basically, we're going to just go around and clean it up a certain area in the community. And if anybody knows Melody Buckley, just about every day she comes